Welcome to the road to growth, success of an entrepreneur. We've raised the bar. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to growth with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. Hi, you Road to Growth listeners. Today we got Len Hurston. Did I say it right? Hurston. Hurston. Yep. Hurston. All right. There we go. Uh, where, where's that? Where's that come? Where's the surname come from? Uh, it's kind of Polish, German, kind of Eastern European area. Yeah. If, if, if I, I know you're into branding, how do you brand your last name? If like we're on an elevator right now, someone's asking you Hurston, how would you to sell it? It's her beer. Her beer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, your background, uh, so you work with, you I mean, big businesses in the past, branding, and then started your own company, and now recently uh, put out a book, correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just put out a book. It's called Be Vigilant, Strategies okay. to Stop Complacency, Improve Performance, and Safeguard Success. Okay. And and you've also done a, um, uh, a big event, I think, for the last 15 years. Is that right? With marketing? 19 and years. Like yeah, almost 20. Wow, twenty years. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm gonna be very curious to dive deeper into that. Putting an event together. I mean, I, I've had some people try to put events together now with uh, everything going digital. Yeah. I can only imagine what you would do if you were putting something like that together these days. Um, so we'll dive into that. But people come here really to kind of hear the uh, the guest journey. Yeah. And kind of see how they can kind of adapt their own life or their own hurdles, things they're working on uh, with that individual. So I'd love to hear. Kind of where you grew up, man. I grew up in New York, uh, in uh, from Brooklyn originally, but grew up in uh, kind of Western Long Island, right in, right next to Queens. Okay. Are your uh, fair your parents from uh, New York also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brooklyn. Yeah. So Brooklyn. All right. So so walk me through. Can uh, high school there, college there, stayed in New York the whole time, or? Yeah, so I went to high school in New York, in uh, in Long Island, a town called Valley Stream, and um, we, uh, you know, typical kind of blue collar working class town in in New York, and then uh, went to Cornell in New in in New York for uh, for college, for university, and uh, so so basically stayed in New York, and then once I started working, I kind of I kind of left. I went all over the place. So, yeah, have I mean. I, I guess, I mean, the first thing that pops in my head when I think of someone that's brandy, I think of someone that's, I guess, more outgoing, idea person. Is that a correct way of, of describing the individual that gets into branding? Yeah, I mean, listen, there's there's a lot of different meanings to what people think branding is, right? So, okay. um, you know, when I came out of, I didn't really get into brand marketing until after I got my MBA. So I, I came out, I came out of undergraduate and I went into kind of the line of work that a lot of people go into and they don't know what they really want to do, which is consulting somehow. So I got into consulting. I was working for Anderson Consulting, which is now Accenture. And I was doing that. They taught me how to be a, like a, a computer programmer. They taught me COBOL too. Oh. And, and uh, I was terrible at it. I hated it. It, it was not my thing. Um, and so I got into this area of the business called change management, where I worked with companies to help them manage that change that these new systems that we were implementing were we're, we're doing. And some of the clients that I worked with ended up being um, marketing company, you know, AT&T, Pepsi. And I started thinking, man, I really like would, would like to be on the other side. So went back, got my MBA. And when I came out, I worked in consumer packaged goods, which was, um, you know, Campbell Soup, Coca-Cola, Nabisco. And when you when you do marketing within those types of companies, it's called we, we typically refer to it as like kind of classically trained brand marketers. So we look at brand marketing as kind of the hub of the wheel. So we we, you know, look, at it's not just advertising. It's not just PR. It's everything that goes into that brand ranging from manufacturing and finance and, and all those things to advertising and PR and market research and, and all those things. So I have a very holistic view of brand marketing to, to people who kind of go into that line of business tend to typically be kind of type A personalities, right? Like they they like being in control of things. They like, you know, being at the forefront of stuff. And so, yeah, they typically do tend to be kind of outgoing and, and uh, you know, people who, who don't shy away from uh, conversations. How did you, so being that when you got out of college, you really didn't know what you, I guess, wanted to do. And they got your MBA, like you talked about, what was that transition of figuring out 
who you wanted to be, where you wanted to work. Where did that, where did that come from? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it, it worked out pretty well for me in that working for Anderson Consulting gave me the opportunity to see a lot of different industries. So, um, like I said, I was, I was working on some consulting projects for Pepsi and I was working on some consulting projects for, um, for AT&T. And then I was also doing a bunch of stuff in the government sector. And so I got to see a lot of different things and a lot of different, um, pieces of businesses. And so that helped me kind of figure out that, gosh, I really would like to be doing something more in this area of marketing. And really, you know, what, what I, you know, having seen both kind of AT&T and, um, and, uh, Pepsi, I kind of figure out, you know, I, I think I would like to be in kind of like this food and beverage side of, of brand marketing. And then I realized, you know what, I needed to make a career change. And so for me, the stimulus, the, the impetus, the way that I can, you know, the catalyst for me making that career change was going back and getting my MBA, which gave me kind of two more years to study and figure it out, right? Figure out what I really wanted to do. Got an internship with a company called Reckon and Coleman, which is Reckon Benkheiser. They make Woolite and a bunch of other stuff that's probably in your house. Um, and, you know, it just started to kind of feel my way through. So it was, it was a multi-year process of kind of figuring out what I liked and what I didn't like um, before I kind of honed in on it. Uh, I mean, going back, I mean, I, I know it's difficult for a lot of people to go back to school. So how, how long of a time frame did you take off from college to going back to your MBA? Yeah, so I graduated. Man, I'm not going to see how old. Well, you can already see how old I am. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I graduated college in 91. And um, and then I went back and started my MBA in 95. Okay. Do you, I mean, I know for, for I mean, I heard this saying, this was probably maybe eight years ago, 10 years ago, I heard the idea that you only remember about 20% of what you learn in college. Yeah. Yet, if you work a job and then go back to school, that number jumps up drastically. Did you feel that you picked up more the second time when you were actually going for your MBA and knew what you wanted or is it very similar? Yeah, no, for sure. I think I think that that's really true. Um, I think, you know, some of it is maturity, right? And, uh, and understanding how the world works and that it's not all about, you know, like, getting ready for your frat party every Friday, you know? Um, and uh, so that maturity, but then also that understanding of what you actually want to do in the world allows you to kind of retain the things that are important to that. Um, but I, I've always be believed that, you know, a lot of the benefit of schooling and, and college and, and all that stuff is just learning how to think, you know, and learning how to look at things differently and critically and how to analyze and how to work with people and, and, developing all those skills. And so once you've been out working and then you come back in, I think you also are more heightened to the, to that, to the need for that and the understanding of that. And so you, you got the internship, you get the job, you're working your way up the ranks uh, in, in the corporation. Yeah. When did you start fit, thinking about the idea of starting your own, own business? So, you know, one of the things I didn't mention, it kind of happened in between. So I came out of business school. I went to work for uh, Nabisco and then Coca-Cola. And then this was right around kind of like, you know, 1999 and, and 2000. And like big thing happened. And then it was like this big dot com explosion. Right. Like it was all this kind of startups and, and all that. And I, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I jumped in on that. So I, uh, I, I went to work for uh, for a startup in, in Colorado in northern Colorado. And um, and it was it was awesome. It uh, like most dot coms, then it failed. And so I had to go back and get a real job again. But but it kind of at that point in time, that kind of like awakened something that I didn't know I had before, which was this kind of affinity for entrepreneurism. Um, and so, you know, up until then, I'd always just been kind of like the good soldier going through going to work every day. And then I realized, man, there's something else out here that's a little bit different. And, and that was kind of cool. And so I kind of tucked that away. I didn't know what to do with it at the time. And uh, you know, one of the things I was always looking for an idea and just never came up with one good enough. And then um, I started, I was, you know, in my job, I'd go to a lot of conferences. I go to a lot of events. I'd go to, you know, marketing conferences a couple, two, three, four times a year. And I, and I started realizing that, man, every time I go to one of these events, I come home, you know, less than satisfied. Let's put it that way. Like I would, I would go and it would look great on paper and I'd be super excited to go. And then I'd get there. And it would be a bunch of people trying to sell me stuff and it wouldn't be executed well. And this was back in the day when like, you know, someone showed up with a Mac without a dongle, everything broke and everybody died, you know, like, so this is, this was, 
I would, I would go home and I would complain about it. My wife got tired of hearing me complain about it. And so one time I, and it was, you know, it's, it's a cliche, but I was on my way back from a conference in new Orleans. I was, you know, this will tell you how long ago it was. I was on a U.S. air flight and I started jotting down on a, on a cocktail napkin, what the next conference I was going to go to, I had to have, and literally, quite literally, on a U.S. Air cocktail. I, I wish I could, I wish I kept it because it'd probably be like a collector's item now. But I, it was, uh, you know, I, I couldn't find a conference that had the things I was looking for. I wanted it to be all keynote speakers. I wanted it to be executed flawlessly. I wanted it to be a 360 degree view of brand marketing. I had this whole list of things that I wanted, and I couldn't, I couldn't uh, find one. And so um, I, I created it. And so I, that's, that's how, that's where brand managed camp came from. I was still working. I was working for Campbell soup at the time. And I created this thing. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea how to start it. Um, but it was in the post nine 11. Um, you know, we just had the 20th anniversary, right? So post nine 11, um, you know, world. And, you know, it was actually a good time to be launching a comp because like there were, great deals on hotels. Hotels were hurting. They were giving away stuff. Like you didn't have to, you know, the, the, the clauses and the cancellation clauses were, were very favorable at that point in time. And so it was kind of a low risk. I was able to keep my risk low and I kept working for Campbell Soup and I started this conference and people came and then, you know, more people came the next year and kind of three years in, I, had, I made the decision to, to do it full time. So in that three year time period, I was doing it, you know, in addition to my job. So I'm not one of these guys who just kind of like quit and set up shop in my garage and like, you know, maxed out my credit cards. I kind of took a little bit more, you know, risk averse approach to it. Do you remember the process for the, for the first one of figuring out, okay, who's the list of people I'm going to invite? How am I going to invite them? How big of a space am I going to need based on the people? I mean, do you remember those ideas or those thoughts of that process? Yeah, I mean, you know, things that I remember are that I, I completely over, you know, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs do this is we completely overvalue the value of our friends, right? <laughs> so we, we go into it and I'm thinking, man, I know, I look at how many people I know from school, from working, look at all these people that I know that are in marketing roles. If I can just get each one of those to send one of their people to my conference, oh man, I'm set, right? And then, uh, and then they're all like, yeah, yeah, I would love to. But then like the realities of the world come into play in terms of like, you know, you're not top of mind as, 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 as top of mind as you'd like to be. And they have budget constraints and they have other people telling them how they can spend their money and all these things. And so I completely overvalued uh, the, the strength of those relationships and, and, and how I was going to be able to monetize those. And it sounds terrible. It sounds greedy to say, how are you going to monetize your relationships? But that's, you know, uh, you gotta, you gotta do what you gotta do when you're starting a business. Right. And so, um, you know, that was one of the things that I, that I distinctly remember. I, I was lucky at the time that I was able to forge a relationship with a, a magazine. It's called brand week, um, which was huge in, in the day. It was one of those things that every brand marketer had. Now it's really hard to reach marketers, but, but back in the day we had a magazine that showed up on everybody's desk and I was able to forge a relationship with them and they were able to help me through like this kind of new idea of email marketing, you know, we didn't have to deal with all the things we have to deal with now in terms of like, you know, you can't seem to get an email through to somebody unless you're selling Cialis or something like that. So <laughs> it's, uh, it was a lot easier back in the day to send emails and stuff. And so that, that all kind of played together to help us, um, you know, when we started, but in terms of like knowing what size I had no idea, I really had no idea. I, I just tried to negotiate the best deal I could with, with a, and it was, and we did it right in Philly cause I was living in Jersey and um, we did it in Philadelphia and we got a, a, a small ballroom and, and it just kind of worked out. What, I mean, I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of business owners, like you said, I mean, you look at your, your friend list, you look at your group and go, oh, Hey, if I can get this person to do it or that person to do it. Yeah. Like you said, you're not top of mind all the time. Right. Yeah. When that happened with you and some of your, close colleagues, close friends didn't come through or didn't invite that person. I mean, was there ever a moment? I know sometimes for some entrepreneurs, there's that moment where you're just like, man, I, I, I'm really angry at that person. I'm really deflated by that person. Or is it just turn the other cheek, focus on something else? How did you react to that the first time? Do you remember? Yeah. You know what? I, I'm not the type of person who gets angry about things. You know, I, I don't see a lot of benefit to it. There's no value to it. It doesn't solve anything. So I, I've always been the type of person who like just looks at a problem and says, hey, do we need to pivot? You know, what, what, what's going on here? What were my assumptions? You know, it kind of plays into, you know, and I know we're going to talk about the book, Be Vigilant, but, but it's all about complacency. 
And one of the things about complacency and, and where complacency falls in is this idea of overconfidence, right? And I was overconfident. I was 100% overconfident. And I think a lot of us are going in because, and we have to be, you know, to be able to take that leap, right? If we were all pessimistic, nobody would ever do it ever. But, you know, very quickly, I understood where my overconfidence was and allowed me to kind of adapt to it. I don't get, I would never get angry at somebody for that because, you know, again, a, you know, a friend is a friend, whether, whether they send somebody to my conference or not, that's not what determines whether they're my friend or not. But, uh, but I did overvalue how, how much that was going to translate. We're going to get into your book. I just have one more question about yeah. your, uh, building that out. Now you said the third year you basically quit your job and I went full time into, into this conference and building it out. When did you know that was okay to do? I mean, there's usually some people financial, some people it's just a gut reaction. When do you know it's okay to quit that to actually go full time on this? Yeah, I didn't know. I, I absolutely okay. didn't know. But uh, but what I did know was this, was that I couldn't do them both anymore. It was becoming uh, too much. We had kids now, and um, which you know would lead you towards maybe the safer route if you were like normal. But uh, I, you know, I, I just didn't have the time to do them both well. It got to a point where I had to make a choice. And and that's where, you know, my wife and I sat down and we said, what do we really want to do here? You know, like what, like, you know, the easy thing is just stay where I'm at. And, um, you know, I could work at Campbell Soup for 20 years and, you know, maybe even, you know, get a retirement, right? And, and something like that. But but uh, but the possibilities and and the joy that we had from doing this other thing was too, was too great. And so um, just made the decision that, you know, I, I needed to kind of go all in to, to see if this thing could, you know, I would never know if it could work if I didn't go all in on it. And so, you know, it just got to the point where it was financially viable enough that, that we could survive on it based on where it was. Um, and, you know, we knew that we had to take take this chance. Um, I remember when I quit, I, uh, I'm not going to mention any names, but there was a guy at the time who was uh, pretty high up in, in Campbell's and uh, he called me into his office. I'd already, I'd, I'd quit that day or something. And, uh, you know, nicely, not like I, I quit, you know, I was like, you know, put it in, gave him my notice, whatever. And, uh, and he called me and he's like, Len, uh, you know, you need to, you need to unquit. You, you, you shouldn't do this. You know, I was like, I was like, wow, this isn't the uh, conversation I was expecting here. So, uh, you know, I, I set up, you know, I was like, I thought it was just going to be one of these like nice little exit things. And it's like, you know, hey, good luck. But he was like, he's like, no, I'm serious. You need to uh, come back tomorrow and uh, tell tell everybody that you're not quitting. And, you know, the, this is a mistake. You're making a mistake with your family and whatever. And uh, and that, that actually kind of like, you know, I'm the type of guy, you know, I'm from New York, right? So that kind of like, it kind of made me want to do it more, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, but it made it scary, you know, it made it scary. But but I knew at that point in time, and this was the right thing for us to, to do. And, you know, here we are 19, 20 years later. So was there any in that 20 year time frame or I guess 17 year time frame where you thought maybe I should go back to a, a corporation for that steady paycheck? Or has it been pretty, pretty good? Yeah, no, it, it always there's always that in the back of your mind. Right. I mean, and and listen, this is this is a tough time to be in the conference business. I mean, you know, like, uh, we, uh, we haven't had a live one in a, in, in a little while now. So, um, you know, I'm always and the, the funny thing is, um, that the more you do this stuff, sometimes the grass is always greener, right? Like people who work for somebody are like, Oh man, I wish I worked for myself. I'd have all the freedom. Right. And then people who work for themselves are like, Oh my God, I can never turn it off. Like I have to work like 24 hours a day. You know, I don't have a day off. I never, you know, even when I'm on vacation, I'm working, you know, it might be kind of nice to clock in and out somewhere and just collect the paycheck, right? Like you get to a point, everybody gets to a point where you start questioning. And, you know, part of, part of, you know, the, the other thing we haven't talked about is I'm actually also uh, a police officer now that yeah. I, that, that, that I did that, you know, six years ago. And so, um, you know, there, that, that's actually kind of like a, a nice part of that part of my, my business, my job, my, my life is that, you know, you work a shift and when the shift is over, it's over, you know, you go home. Um, sometimes it runs late and you got to have the mentality where you can turn it on and off in your head. But if you can, it's, you know, there's kind of nice. It's like, okay, here, you know, it's like, you know, blow the whistle, slide down the dinosaur and go off and have a brontosaurus burger, you know? <laughs> the, um, 
Yeah, let, let's jump into that. So that was yeah six years ago that you signed up to be a, was it a volunteer sheriff? I guess. Yeah, sheriff's deputy. Yep. Sheriff deputy. Yeah. I mean, what? Where did that 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 idea come from of, of helping help people out and and giving your time for, um, for that position? Yeah, you know, I was looking for a way to to give back to the community. Um, but I was looking, you know, my wife is very, very heavily involved in Girl Scouts and she was doing a lot of volunteer work and all that stuff. And I was like, man, I really like would, would like to do some volunteer work. And I hadn't up until that point, but I wanted to find something that I would actually enjoy doing. Um, and this opportunity came up. It was like a Facebook post, like out of nowhere. And it was like they're running a, an academy. Like I had to go to like, you know, a real academy and, and um, I had to go through this whole selection process. But I was like, man, this is a time period where, you know, we all know what's been happening in the last year and a half. Um, obviously, uh, but I mean, you know, people forget this kind of started several years ago, like, you know, with Ferguson and, and all that, there was a lot of things going on between policing and community and all that. And I, I wanted to be part of the solution. You know what I mean? I didn't want to be this guy who like got into like Facebook arguments with people and then like went off and, and, uh, you know, and, and didn't do anything about it. So, you know, the best way that I could figure out to be part of the solution is to actually become a good cop and, 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 you know, like the vast vast majority of cops out there but i wanted to be out there doing it right and um and not just talking about it so so that's that's why i i, I got into that do you do you I mean i'm assuming over the 20 years some of the stuff that you were doing when you first started is stuff that you're not doing now is how does your is your time affected by volunteering uh, in this position is it has it been a, a good synergy has it been more difficult i mean what does that look like? Yeah, no, it, it's it's a challenge because when I go into something, I kind of go all in all the time. So it's like I, you know, I, I've had years where I've put in, you know, up up to eight hundred and fifty hours a year on, you know, almost half time, right? On on police work, and so you know, I've had to juggle my calendar and juggle my schedule to fit around it. Um, you know, it's kind of you know, unfortunately, it's kind of helped the uh, the pandemic has like kind of killed conferences for a little bit so i've had more a little bit more free time and i've been writing a book too so um you know it's it, it's just like anything else i mean it, you know if you want to do something you figure out how to do it right and you know the beauty of police work is you know i the the shift i typically work is what we call a swing shift so it's you know it's more afternoon into the evening you know up to midnight um and so you know and i can do that on friday you know i can do friday and saturday and you know, still have the vast majority of my work weekend, right? Now you kind of talked about that you recently started putting the book together. Was this something that was brought along because of COVID, or no? The idea for the book came pre-COVID, okay. um, and so basically, what had happened is I, I I went to work and you know in the police, I, I had to go through you know police academy, and then I had to go through a full field training thing, and. I kind of went at it thinking this was going to be very, very different than my other life, right? It was going to be completely different than marketing and business and all that stuff. And I started to realize that there's this overlap that I wasn't expecting. Things I was learning that I was thinking about, like, this applies back. I can use this in marketing. I can use this in my business. Um, and, and the first and foremost thing was this idea that complacency kills, right? So we learn this in the academy day one. It's always driven into us. Um, you know, because complacency is something that's a big problem in police work because 99% of the time everything goes right. And, you know, 1% of the time everything goes to hell and you got to be ready. Right. And if you're not ready, that's when things really go bad. And so, um, you know, I started thinking, man, complacency also kills brands. It kills businesses. It kills, uh, organizations. Complacency kills personal relationships. You know, how many people or, you know, do we know in our lives who like seemingly had the best marriage and then next thing we know we're, they're getting divorced, right? And what changed, right? Well, a lot of that can be played, you know, come back to complacency and things that we do because we get complacent. So I kind of got obsessed with understanding complacency and understanding what it is and what it isn't. And, and then I started thinking, seeing all the things that we do every day in law enforcement. We don't talk about it in terms of let, we do this because we're trying not to be complacent. But we do these things. And I was like, man, these are things that we do actively every day to fight complacency. And we can do this in business. We can do this in our life. And so that's where that book idea came from. And it was, it was right before COVID started is when I started writing it. Well, you, you threw me a softball. I got to ask the next question. Yeah. Can you give us an idea of some of those things that 
um, that you talked about for place C to fight against it? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, there, there are things that we do every day in law enforcement. I think that the first thing real quick, what I, what I want to do is just kind of define complacency because a lot of people think that, you know, complacency is laziness, right? And we, we throw the word out a lot. And in fact, you know, I, I'm sure within the next couple of days, you'll hear someone on TV or in the news or somewhere say something about complacency, especially as it relates to COVID. Or if you're a sporting fan, you know, when you're watching sports, they'll say it a lot. Oh, they're getting complacent out there or whatever, you know, but nobody ever talks about what it really means. Right. And so complacency is really overconfidence, self-satisfaction, self-satisfaction, smugness that develops from past success. Right. Mm-hmm. So the more successful we are, the more we attribute that excess to our own actions, which makes us feel overconfident about our own actions. And it makes us soft, right? It makes us vulnerable, makes us open. So, so uh, complacency is not laziness. It's overconfidence, right? And the opposite of complacency is not paranoia, right? It's not like, how do we like, you know, looking over our shoulder all the time, it's vigilance. Right. And vigilance, the difference is vigilance is the awareness of danger and paranoia is the fear of danger. So it's not about not about walking around fearful. So things that we do every day in law enforcement, one thing that's super easy that we do is threat awareness. Right. I don't know if you have any family or friends in law enforcement and you've ever or military and you go out to dinner with them or you go out to a meal, you'll find that they can be a little annoying to go to a restaurant with because we have specific places that we're willing to sit. We want to keep our threats in front of us, right? We want to be able to enjoy ourselves, but at the same time, I don't want my back to a window and I don't want my back to a door. And I don't want, you know, I don't want to be sitting in the middle of a restaurant where I don't have 360 degree awareness, little things. So I can understand where those threats are coming from. And so that's something that we do all the time. We're always thinking about where can that threat be coming from? And how do we, when you see two cops, you know, uh, side by side in their cars, right? You know, facing different directions, um, park somewhere. You might think they're just kind of blowing, you know, wasting time and, and goofing off. But really what they're doing probably is one of them is probably writing a report and the other one is helping them keep an eye out so that nobody sneaks up on them, right? So what, by doing that, they're able to get, you know, mm-hmm. divide their responsibilities in half, right? I only have to look in front of me on the sides of me and you only have to look on. So in business, what that means is how are you keeping awareness of all your threats who in your organization is responsible not only for monitoring what your kind of known competitors are doing but what where the next competitor can come from where the next threat can come from right so that's one thing threat awareness another one that's really easy to talk about is is debriefing so one of the things i talk about in the book is briefing and debriefing and so you know every shift we do a brief right before we before we start we all get together and we talk about things but the thing that we do that's really important is we debrief things when they happen. So when we have something that take place, we immediately debrief. And if you think about in business, you might say, well, we do debriefs too, right? We talk about things after it happens. But if you're really honest with yourself, more than likely what you're doing is you're debriefing things when stuff goes wrong, right? And really what it turns into in a lot of organizations is who, who's to blame? Like who, who messed up here, right? How, how can we place blame? Debriefing is about, the idea that vigilance is questioning everything, even when everything goes right, because sometimes things go right by accident. Some things think sometimes things go right, but they go right and they could have gone better. Right. You want to be like, you know, uh, Peyton Manning and Tom Brady, and you want to look at that game tape, whether you won or lost, because there's always room for improvement. And if you have that mentality, you're already fighting complacency. So those are two easy examples. Hmm. Yeah. All right. no, I love it. Yeah. Um, so writing the book, did you have a, a game plan of putting together? How did you understand, uh, the process of putting it together? Was it a coach? Was it Googling? What, what, where did that process come from? Yeah. So I actually, um, spent a lot of time trying to figure out, do I want to try and find a major publisher? Do I want to self publish? There's all these different hybrid models. Um, you know, I had the benefit of over, you know, all the 19 different brand managed camp conferences that I've done, excuse me. I've worked with a lot of authors um, and all these best-selling authors. And so I talked to a lot of them. What do they recommend in terms of which direction? And a lot of the advice I got was, you know, listen, you don't, the traditional publishing model doesn't, isn't as applicable anymore based on the world that we're in, based on Amazon, based on all the things. 
that are going on and a, and a traditional publisher is going to make you do all your marketing anyways and they're going to you know they're going to help you through it i i actually went this hybrid model where i found a, a company uh it's called book launchers they're right there in california um and um they help me through the process. So, you know, throughout the process, I had someone who worked with me on my story development and I'm putting together the idea and putting together the flow of it. And then, you know, as I got more into the writing, I had people who were doing the edits, you know, whether it be, you know, the content edit or the copy edit or the proofreading or all that stuff all the way through. And now, you know, I'm working with a different team that's working on, you know, getting that book, you know, into places where people buy books and promoting it and all that stuff. So they've helped me through that whole process. I couldn't have done it without them for sure. How, how did you come across book launchers? Was it just word of mouth? No, a couple. Yeah, yes, word of mouth. So uh, a couple of the speakers that I have worked with and and who are authors had worked with them and had really positive things to say. And so, um, you know, I reached out and we kind of made a connection that way. When, because your book's not currently released, right? It's in pre-order right now. So you can go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Apple Books and you can pre-order it um it's available in hardcover paperback and an ebook um and you just search for be vigilant or be vigilant book and uh and you can get that or the, or you can get the links on my website lenherstein.com and um you can get the links there but it, it officially launches october 14th so that's kind of the official ship day but you can pre-order it now so based off of the time that you're listening to this podcast uh if you're watching us live go pre-order it if you're listening to the audio it might be out already. It might, it might be out tomorrow, the next day, next <laughs> week. So, uh, yeah, if you're listening to the audio, it could be out there. Um, now, walking back, I mean, from knowing what you know now, or if someone else is looking to build an event, yeah. Right, if you're talking to your younger self or someone else trying to build an event, what advice do you think you'd give to that person or your or younger self? You know, I, I think one of the things that I always like to say about the event business is it's like it's like a lot of things like you're a realtor right so i mean i I would say it's probably very similar to that it's really easy to be a realtor it's really hard to be a good realtor right it's really easy to put on an event you get a place you book a room you try and market it it's really hard to put on a good event and so for people who are looking to put on events i think you know getting back to complacency you don't want to become overconfident you want to say oh well, i've put on stuff in our business before i i've thrown parties before i know what that's about you want you've got to choreograph every piece of that event from the first contact to the marketing to the, when people uh register what happens then to you know when they arrive to the event and the seating and the food and the audio visual and all those things you want to craft the experience that makes them want to come back again right and so you know when for people who are thinking that they want to start an event i would say you know you got to pay attention to the details it's the little things it's the little things when you show up at someone wherever you are if you went to uh, a meeting or a dinner or a conference or whatever it is you know when everything goes right you barely notice right the second that someone slide jumps out for a second, you're like, oh man, AV problems. This is terrible. You know, or their microphone stops working or whatever it is. Those are the things that people remember. Unfortunately, it's just the it's just the way the world works, right? And so, you know, if you're gonna put on an event, you got to strive for flawless execution across all of those elements. And you have to take time to understand what are all those touch points. Um, and how do you how do you maximize? And then, you know, some of the things that we talk about in a book, how do you scenario plan? What happens when this happens? What happens if someone has an allergy and they don't get the right meal? What happens when a speaker is late or a speaker doesn't show up, right? What happens when the microphone dies? What happens when the lights go out? You got to you got to you got to be prepared, right? Because the time to figure out what you're going to do in a crisis is not when you're in the crisis, right? Do you think there's, I mean... I know there'd be small changes, but I get the core would be the right same. If someone was looking to start a virtual event, mm-hmm. right, without any kind of background in, in events, is yeah. there anything they should kind of focus on a little bit differently or is it fairly, fairly similar? No, I mean, I think it's the same general principles. I think it's way easier to become overconfident in a virtual event, right? Because, um, you know, it's like, hey, we've all done Zoom meetings, right? Like, oh, I can do a Zoom meeting. But, you, you know, you you do this all the time. You know that it's not as simple as that, right? Um, you know, there are things, you know, I mean, uh, we didn't talk about this ahead of time, but you know, I, I do this a lot. So I have good lighting and I have a good camera and I have a, you know, a lavalier microphone and I've got an earpiece 
So I'm not echoing and, and all those things. I'm sure you come across people who don't have those setups or who, you know, and it's not, a, it's, it's not as great of an experience when somebody's not using a microphone and they're echoing in the room and, you know, they've got light coming in behind them. So they're blacked out like, you know, like a, you know, like a, a witness on a, on a TV show. Right. Like, I mean, so bad, bad connections. I mean, yeah, no, there's a lot of yeah. these things that go wrong. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's learning as the person putting together, like for myself or the host for the, for the road to growth podcast. I mean, understanding, okay, well, how can I inform the, the guest about these things yet also not overwhelming them. Cause you send yeah. a whole two pages of stuff to the person yeah. and they're going, I'm not going to read this. I'll read the spark notes, right? but it, you're not sending them enough information. So it's that balancing act. It feels like, well, it, it's also that, and it's also dealing with other people's overconfidence, especially when you're doing a show like this, right. Or you're doing yeah. something, you know, I'm sure a lot of your guests are not, you know, I shouldn't be saying this. I don't know your guests, but <laughs> I, I know, let me say this. A lot of people I've worked with in the past, are not necessarily as humble as other people in the world, right? And so, um, you know, telling them what to do is hard, right? Because they're like, hey, I've done this before. I know how to, I've done a meeting on the internet before. It's okay. Don't worry about me, buddy. I'll be there, right? And then it's like in the back of your mind, you're thinking, oh, you know, but do you though? Because, <laughs> because you know, I think I know something about this and it's hard. It's a hard line to walk, right? In terms of helping people along without insulting them. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. If let's say we're talking in five years from now, like, yeah, where are you going to be? Where's your business going to be? I mean, is it going to be another book? What's what would you be telling us about, you, about yourself? Oh man, that's a good question. Um, I tell you what, uh, you know, I don't know if I'll write another book. This one was really hard to write. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I I think it's going to be kind of like pregnancy amnesia. I don't know. Do you, I don't know if you have children or not, but. Generally, what happens is you have that first one. You're like, oh, never again, man. And then like a couple <laughs> of years later, you see somebody else with a new baby. You're like, ah, maybe I could do it. Maybe I could do it. It wasn't that bad. You forget how how hard it was at the beginning. And so, you know, it's going to take me a couple of years, I think, to get over the trauma of, of writing this first book. But, um, you know, we'll see. We'll see if people like it or not. I, I hope people will like it. You know, I, I'm, I'm really kind of super passionate about um, the law enforcement side of my of my life right now. I just really get so much satisfaction out of helping people that I didn't have for the first 45 years of my life. Um, and so, you know, it's funny, like, I remember, I don't know if you remember Pat Tillman, I mean, uh, it was yeah, Max, Pat, Tillman. Pat, Pat Tillman, right? He left yeah. the NFL to, you know, I'm not trying to compare myself to him. He went on to be like a green beret and then he actually gave his life for our country. But, um, but I remember at the time before any of that stuff happened, thinking like, how could somebody go from that to that? Like, that's a big shift at that point in life. Right. Um, but I kind of understand a little bit now. I, 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 I uh, there's a lot of value to her. You know, I'm, I'm, I've begun re reevaluating what's important in my life. Yeah. Right. And what success looks like. And I think success to me looks different now than it did 20 years ago. Have you started to look at how you transition out of this business or leveraging this business to focus more on that? Or have you started making the steps in that direction or not yet? Uh, yeah, no, I, th I think first of all, the book was, was my first step in that, in that direction because the book helps me do kind of both things. Cause, cause it, 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 it ties the two pieces of my life together, which provided a lot of satisfaction for me taking this kind of newfound love, of, of public service and then tying it back with my business world and, and doing it in a way where I could, you know, help people in business think uh, differently. That's been really satisfying. So, I mean, that's something that that is me setting my, myself up for, for the future of what I want to do, which is help people fight complacency and help people um, safeguard the success. We, we spend a lot of time talking about how to get successful and we don't spend a lot of time thinking about how do we stay that way. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's that's what this is all about. And and, you know, I, I think in five years, law enforcement is still going to be a big part of my life. Um, I don't know in what in what, you know, magnitude or what that would look like in terms of the conference business. Man, I don't know. Like right now, um, we just we did two um, virtual events in a row. So 2020 and 2021, we did virtual events. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't love doing virtual events. I like being around people. Um, and I just think that it's very difficult to set yourself out and apart from the competition 
in virtual world because it's so easy to do virtual, you know, in some way, shape or form. Um, and it's so hard to charge for it, to be honest with you. So, yeah. um, you know, monetizing that has become more difficult. So right now we're kind of in a wait and see pattern on what, what happens in the next few months in terms of what brand managed camp 2022 looks like yeah. and, and where we go with that. And I'm just kind of putting all my effort into this book and getting the word out about the book and hopefully getting people to buy it and, uh, and help them, uh, you know, keep the success they work so hard to get. Do you think we'd ever get to the point where we, we or when do you think we get to the point of 3D goggles and having a virtual event in that in that way of being virtually there with the Avatar? Man, I, I don't know. I, I can tell you this. People crave human interaction. Yeah. Uh, you know, people have always, you know, even before pandemic world, people were talking about how virtual and streaming was going to kill the live business, right? Um, I think the only, the only reason that that's, semi true is because businesses hate spending money on things that they don't see value in. And so I think, I think there's going to be a large kind of culling out of, of the things now that businesses have seen, you know what, I don't have to spend this much money on travel, sending people all around to go to what amounts to boondoggles. And I don't have to, um, you know, I don't have to, I can get their training in different ways. And so that is going to be something different, but at the end of the day, people need to interact and people need to get together in person. And so I don't think it's ever going to do away with it. Um, and, you know, I remember getting one of the first, like not one of the, but I remember we had, I mean, I have a, a 3d TV sitting in my living room. I mean, who, you, know, you know how much content I watch in 3d? Absolutely zero, none. Right. Sometimes the thing pops up and erroneously detects a 3d image and tells me it's 3d, but it's not. And so, <laughs> It's like, you know, I remember when those TVs came out, it was like, I remember going to, uh, to, um, oh, what's the, uh, what's the show in Vegas? Um, uh, Sir Slay or no, or, no, no, no. Like the big uh, oh, technology the, event. The Michael Jackson one, the one that where he has, no, a no, no. It's a big, it's a big conference, worldwide conference on technology oh. and, and, uh, the consumer electronics show CS. Okay. And, and, uh, I remember when they first like launched 3d TVs, it was like, oh my God, this is going to change everything. We're going to be immersed in the content. And the, and the thing is that, you know, that, that stuff never, never really came to fruition. Right. Uh, yeah. Nobody, you know, everybody's got 3d capable TVs, but nobody watches anything in 3d. And I think, I think this kind of like putting on goggles and, you know, walking around a conference too. I think, I think it sounds good in, in theory, but I, I I'm skeptical. No, it makes sense. Well, thank you. Thank you, Len, for being here. Hopefully everyone got here with great nuggets. I know I did places to see is, I mean, I think it's huge for everyone. I mean, you, you constantly have to figure out, be a shark, right? Keep moving. Yeah. Keep yeah, moving. Got to keep. I, I talk about one of the concepts in the book is get off the X, which is exactly that. You have to keep moving. You have to keep moving so you're not predictable and that you change your stimuli and you do all the things. Um, I, I highly, I, I hope everybody will at least check out the book. It's Be Vigilant. Uh, and you can just go to lenhurstein.com or even just go to bevigilantbook.com. And you can uh, find out all the information there. I can almost guarantee you that when you read this book, you will immediately see areas of your own life and your own business um, where you are complacent right now. And that, that's that's the insidiousness of, of complacency. The, by definition, you don't know that you're complacent when you're complacent, right? Yeah. So. Well, th thank you again, Len, for being here. Everyone, go to the show notes. The show notes will have the information that, where you can get the book. If you're listening to it on audio, it might it might be out if it's not pre-order right now. Uh, thank you again. Please subscribe, please share, and go see Len. Have yeah. a great one, everyone. Thanks, Vinny.